So we should be live and I'm going to give it a few minutes. I still haven't seen any official announcement about Unraveler like getting pushed back. Um, I don't know. I guess I kept expecting like the publisher to be like to make an announcement, but they yeah, haven't. I guess it's not like a high profile enough. I guess release. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like they don't even bother to tell us that it's not coming out until like next year. I guess. Um, I mean, all the all the book websites are like showing it coming out next year, but there's no, um, and like Goodreads, I think, has it shows that it's coming out next year but there's been like no official word i'm like i guess this is what's happening <laughs> okay let me just pull up youtube to check yeah it, it looks live to me oh. okay good awesome yay kelly's here Oh, I didn't anticipate the lag on the comments. I knew there was a lag on the video. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. It's like you have to you have to like stagger the windows like perfectly so that it doesn't like bug you for the whole live show. Okay. Oh, I should probably say on Twitter that we have officially gone live. I always forget to do that part for some reason. Like I do the reminders and then I just ignore it. <laughs> okay. I'm just gonna do a quick That is way too many exclamation points, but I'm committed. <laughs> We're excited. Yes, we are. Okay. Okay. So I think, let's see, we have, we're like a few minutes in. So I think we can kind of start doing the introductory stuff. And um, like we were saying before we went live. I think this book, um, yeah, like, so we're, we're going to have a spoiler free section at the beginning and then a spoiler section at the end. And I think we can go ahead and get started with the intro stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, hello everybody. Welcome. Whether you are watching this live or the playback, I know that, um, some people are planning to watch the playback and, um, this is obviously our first live show for the Francis Harding read along. Um, and our first book is Fly By Night. This is the only book that is in a series. Um, so we're gonna be reading the sequel next month. That's the only one that we're reading out of publication order. Um, and this like read along is pretty self-explanatory, but basically me and Hannah have loved Frances Harding for a long time and we have wanted an excuse to talk about her <laughs> and share her with more people and to finally finish reading all of her books. Um, so that's what we're doing. And we're doing one book per month. Um, the most recent or the upcoming release from her it looks like that one is getting pushed back um so we will we will do some kind of adjustment as we get closer to that but that wouldn't have been happening until um like the middle of next year anyway so but just in case you were wondering about that we have noticed <laughs> so we'll have to like um kind of adjust that but yeah so this is our first live show we're going to start off with some introductions so um, Hannah, would you like to go first? Just talk a little bit about um, what you like, the kinds of things that you do on your blog, kind of kinds of books you like to read, and um, your experience with Frances Harding. Obviously, we both love her, but if you have anything to add to that, yeah. Um, hi everyone. I am Hannah. I blog primarily at Lynn Hermione. Um, I read a pretty good mix of things, um, but with sort of an extra splash of fantasy. Um, although less so recently. Um, and I, so I first discovered 
I first read Fly By Night when I was probably seven, I think. Um, and I hated it. <laughs> Did not, I just, I didn't understand it at all. The language went completely over my head. The plot was way too convoluted. I just I couldn't do it. Um, but then I read uh, a few of her other books when I was a teenager and really, really loved them. Um, and then kind of got into her from there. And I've read about half of her books now. So quite a few of these will be new to me as we go through the life, the read along. Um, yeah. So this is, I tried to read Fly By Night again last year, but again, like it's very complicated. And at the start of the pandemic, I was not in a brain space to be able <laughs> to read that. Um, yeah. So this is my second time reading it in full. Okay. Um, oh, and by the way, Hannah is already linked in the description box, but I will need to add your Instagram because for some reason I didn't think to put that in there. She has lovely bookstagram photos that I can sometimes, <laughs> like Instagram, if you don't have an account, it lets you kind of look at things. So, <laughs> um, but I can, I can tell that she's very talented at that as well. Oh, well um, I don't know about that, but <laughs> thank you. Your, your photos are very pretty. I don't know if you're talking about um okay hi everyone so my name is Kara obviously you know my channel since you're here um but it's wild book garden and I should have mentioned this when we were talking about the project but all of the live shows will be hosted on my channel just for ease of use but I'm not going to be running the discussion for all of them me and Hannah have split them um so just a note on that and yeah like I obviously also really love Frances Harding um I have read this book once before and it was a few years ago and I remember really liking it at the time, um, but I remembered very little of the actual story. Like there were some specific things that like really stood out to me. And then the rest of it, I had like no idea. <laughs> um, I really didn't remember a lot of like the, the plot of this one. Um, so this was like a really interesting experience because it was kind of like reading some parts for the first time. Um, yeah, and as far as how this stacks up, with other books by this author, which like Hana, you kind of talked about too. I don't think this is my favorite of hers, but I still think it's a really interesting book. And like, I, I enjoyed reading it again um, and obviously really excited to discuss it. And as for like other books I talk about on my channel, I'm doing this all out of order, um, but I read a lot of everything pretty much, um, a lot of fantasy and historical fiction, but I also read contemporary and nonfiction. Um, I read all over the age range map. That is something that is very important to me. And yeah, I think that's, I think that'll do it for intros. Um, okay, so before we get into the spoiler free section, I do wanna give a quick content note. Um, I'm gonna mention only the things that I think could come up in discussion. Um, this book does deal with grief and there are references to child marriage, execution, and religious persecution. I don't know if any of those are going to come up in discussion, but they could. Um, and I will let you guys know before we get into the spoiler section um, of the of the live show here. I think the majority of our thoughts can actually be talked about in a spoiler-free way, but um, we'll see as we go. So um, we kind of did this a little bit already, but um, Hana, do you have any other like kind of overall thoughts on the book? Like what what is your like big picture of how how it went for you I, this time around? Well, I really I really enjoyed it. Like you said, I didn't really remember much of the plot. Um, especially so when I read it last year, I got about halfway through and quite a lot of the big twists and stuff happens after that. Um yeah. so so I just <laughs> didn't remember any of it from when I was seven. Um and I, so I thought that the plot was very cleverly done, the way all the different layers are woven together. And obviously I loved her writing. Um, so I gave it four and a half stars. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very similarly, I am just very impressed at the, the, like the craftsmanship of the story and the plot and how everything fits together in really clever ways. Um, for me, I think like there were some things about the ending some things I really liked and some things I didn't find as satisfying. Um, I think I'm at like a four stars for this one, but I don't know, it, it might be closer to a four and a half. Like I just love her writing so much that even if aspects of the story don't land for me as well, it's just like a very enjoyable reading experience. Um, so yeah, I, I really liked this one as well. And 
as we've been saying, like it was just a very interesting experience to know that I was rereading something, but have like no idea what was going to happen in some ways um, outside of a couple of things. And like, not even like, I remembered some of the big things, but then there were also just like weirdly specific details that like I remembered very clearly. So um, that was an interesting time. Um, let's go ahead and talk about our, well, I was going to say two main characters. I think Mosca is like the actual protagonist. Mm -hmm. Um, but how did we feel about Mosca Mai as our main character? I I really love Mosca. I thought um, I thought she was very um, realistically done in the way that she trying not to spoil anything like the kind of emotional or moral arc, I guess, um, in terms of the things that she did and the turning point for her um, and mm -hmm. like. The way she kind of came into herself over the course of the book, I thought was um, really lovely. Yeah. Yeah, I really liked her too. Um, and I, I just think she's very, like you were saying, very believable. I think Frances Harding does a really good job of writing kids that feel like kids, but who have been through a lot and how you can see that, how that has affected them. Um, I, yeah, I think, I think her emotional, like you said, her emotional and moral arc was really lovely. And um I really like that we see her we see her kind of like struggling to figure out how far she is willing to go with things mm -hmm. like and um we, it's almost it's almost like she's figuring out her own moral compass as we go through the book um which I thought was really well done and I also really like the way that she treated the other characters like um the cakes. I don't remember her actual mm -hmm. name, but I really liked her. And I really like that her and Mosca became friends, even though they're very, very different people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I always just tend to really love Frances Harding's main characters and that applied here as well. Yeah. And um, I think um, I think it's it makes total sense that she kind of doesn't know what her morals are at the beginning or that she, you know, she's been so unloved that she kind of latches onto the first person who shows any interest in her and that makes complete sense to me and that yeah. it then takes her a while to work out what she actually thinks um yeah. and I thought also what you were talking about about um children's characters there's a throwaway line towards the end where um she's surprised that Miss Kitely sees her as a child yeah. um <laughs> and I just like I felt that <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> she's like a very old soul in a lot of ways, but um, yeah, I think I think she's very well written, um, and she's only like twelve or thirteen. So the fact, like you were saying, the fact that she has so much, like she's she's figuring things out. You know, she's figuring out what her beliefs are and like where she stands and what she's willing to sacrifice, and um, it all felt very natural to me. Um, yeah, so I'm sure we're going to come back to Mosca later because she's obviously a very important character. But I also want to talk about Eponymous Clint, um, the other lead. Yeah, just like thoughts on him because I have some. <laughs> like... I, I just, I, ju I don't know how I, I have such mixed feelings on him. He's just, yeah. I don't know, so hard to like pin down, I guess. Um, he... Yeah, I, I guess he's he's interesting because in a similar way to Mosca, he also kind of has to work out his own moral compass, um, although he hides it better. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, like, I'm struggling to verbalize what I feel about him. Yeah, um, I, I also have, like, very very mixed feelings on him um like he, he's a hard character to make up your mind about um mm because -hmm. he's one of those characters where i would have i would feel like i had figured out i had figured him out i like knew how i felt about him and then he'd do something else and i'm like wait <laughs> yeah like you don't know sure that he's if not a villain then like at least not a good person but then he like just occasionally he'll do something yeah. surprisingly nice yeah um one thing that was really interesting that I like, I remembered from the first time I read this book, I liked his and Mosca's friendship. 
And this time around, I'm like halfway through the book. I'm like, they still hate each other. <laughs> like, when are they going to be friends? So I like, I don't know. I think I had, I think I had like um, remembered them being more friendly to each other than they actually were. I don't know like how that happened, but I was expecting there to be, I guess, I guess I was expecting their friendship to be more of a straightforward, like positive thing. And it's not <laughs> like there's a lot of um, it's yeah. If it's a friendship, it's a very antagonistic one. <laughs> yeah, I mean they're basically double crossing each other for three quarters of the book. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm and interested can... to see like where it goes in the second book. Yes, in the sequel, and we can talk about some specifics with them in our spoiler section, but. Um, because I, I think that that might also be interesting but yeah like they're definitely separately they are very dynamic and interesting characters and then together they are they're just very messy <laughs> like, uh, but messy messy in a way that felt like good writing you know not mm -hmm. like it didn't feel like Frances Harding didn't know what she was doing or like what kind of characters she was writing mm -hmm. it was like no like I I see why these two people would butt heads constantly <laughs> like um also, can, do we want to talk a little bit about Saracen? I hadn't initially put him down, but I'm like, we got to talk about the goose yeah. sidekick. <laughs> like, yeah, my notes say Saracen in all caps with about five exclamation marks. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Um, he like he was great. He was a, I mean, full character in his own right. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. I saw I saw one of the. Um, I think it was a review for this book. It might have been for the sequel. I don't remember. But somebody was talking about how. Harding always writes animal characters that are fun but still feel like actual animals um which I think Saracen is a great example of like I mean I, I don't have a goose but this like <laughs> lines up perfectly with everything I have ever heard about geese <laughs> like um yeah no he he was such a he was such a fun character um and very yeah very like goose like but also I don't know how to explain it, except that I agree with that reviewer. It's like he feels like an animal, but he also feels like like some like an animal who has personality. Which, like those of us who have pets, like you know, they do they do have personalities. Um, yeah. Do we have like? Do you have any like other characters um, that we want to talk about before we get into some of the other like book questions? And there's a few that we're going to talk about like later on in the video that we talked about mm -hmm. prior to the live show. Um, so anyone besides those that we want to cover or anyone yeah. who's watching along, if you have a suggestion. Yeah. I didn't, I thought like all of the side characters were very well drawn. They all felt believable. Um, but I think any of my thoughts on them will be quite spoilery. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did think one thing, this is not like a big element of the book or anything, but I remembered this part from the first time I read it and I was struck by it again I find it very weird how people keep assuming that Clint and Mosca are married um like I I know that in, in this world apparently like sometimes people get married very young but I thought that was like a weird detail like there was the um the guy who owns the marriage house that they stay at like I, I don't know he I, I wasn't disliking him as a character and then he kept bringing that up and I'm like you're mm, like a little uncomfortable so I don't have any specific thoughts about that part I just thought that was like interesting <laughs> I think it does do something to set up the world though which is mm -hmm. you know helpful okay so um let's talk about the writing because I know that is one of both of our favorite things about her books um just kind of like overall thoughts, like how would you characterize her writing style? It, which I know is hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, it's just very, I don't know, like dynamic, I guess, or like it's just, um, I have a quote that I pulled out um, that's non-spoilery, um, just that, okay. The path was a struggle, was a troublesome, fretful thing. It worried that it was missing a view of the opposite hills and insisted on climbing for a better look. Then it found the breeze uncommonly chill and ducked back among the trees. It suddenly thought it had forgotten something and doubled back, then realised that it hadn't and turned about again. At last it struggled free of the pines, plumped itself down by the riverside, complained of its aching stones and refused to go any further. 
a sensible, well-trodden track to go over. It's just like everything in her world feels alive. I don't know how else to describe it. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's a really lovely way to describe it. Um, she just she's so good at like writing that is whimsical but is also grounded. Um, like I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily call her writing like flowery, but it's she's so good at setting the tone and um, like the atmosphere. But she also is really great at character work, and I think that's one of the things that I love about her writing and that can sometimes frustrate me about more like. I don't know, overtly poetic styles is I feel like a lot of times the characters get lost in that. And I never feel like that with her books. Like, I love the descriptions. I love the way that she can do a setting, but I don't ever feel like that's taking over the book, you know? Um, and yeah, it's very, it's very like playful writing, but then there's also always a lot of darkness in her books too. Like, I just think she's really good at like balancing things like that. Um, and that was a great yeah. quote. I had noticed that one as well. I was like, this is very indicative of what she does. Like, Yeah, I feel like like it, it is very descriptive, but all of the description and all of the like metaphors and such, they're all for a purpose. And mm -hmm. they all like, you know, it's not just there to be, sometimes flowery writing feels like it's trying too hard or like it's just there for the, per like for its own sake. Whereas here, like yeah. every character description really actually adds something. Yeah. Yeah. Like nothing is wasted. And so even when you get kind of a longer passage about, um, about like what a setting looks like or about like what a character is doing, it like, it contributes to the story. So it doesn't feel overdone. Um, mm -hmm. one thing I also think is interesting about her writing, which we have talked about this a lot, <laughs> but like where her books fit in terms of like age categories and like reading this book, I think, or rereading, I should say, really solidified what I think is one of the main reasons why it's so hard to categorize her books in the traditional like middle grade, young adult, etc. I think it's because that like rigid system is really not set up for books that write characters of all ages with like equal importance. You know, like if you're reading a middle grade or young adult book, this the assumption is like a lot of the good ones obviously don't do this. But the assumption is that the younger characters are going to be the really fleshed out ones. And then the adult characters, you might have one or two who are yeah, important. That's a really good point. But for the most part, they're like supporting. And then if you read an adult book, the assumption is that it's about the adults. And then occasionally there'll be a kid there to like make something happen. Um Whereas like Frances Harding's books, like Mosca Mai is the main character, but then we also have Eponymous Clint. And then we also get some sections where we get perspectives from like completely different characters, like the Cakes, um, mm -hmm. who's, I, who's like a few years older than Mosca. And like, we get the same level of detail and care, no matter who we're following. And like characters like characters of all ages are like equally active in the story. Like obviously Mosca does a lot more of the plot stuff than like some of the supporting characters, but it does, it doesn't ever feel like the other characters are there as like an afterthought or to like just support her, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was one thing that I, like, I think this time around, I was like, that's one of the things that I think makes this book hard to do, like, or hard to label, I guess. Yeah, no, I, I hadn't thought about that, but that, is a really good point. It is. That that's definitely a factor. Um, but I just like in in terms of age category, like it, I know it. Like in some ways, it reads like a children's book, and in some ways, it really just doesn't. Like um, yeah. even in terms of like the layers of the plot, you know, it's complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um. There was yeah. There was a line about. Um, let me see if I can find it about um, oh, we know that your boat like many other maids hides a secret in her belly I was like this is true. <laughs> yeah. yeah some things that the target audience might not pick up on until later <laughs> um, yeah and I think like this goes back to um, how so many of those labels are I don't not not probability what am I trying to say it's like there, you have to generalize, and I get that, because otherwise the labels wouldn't be helpful, but I feel like there's so many exceptions to them that I don't know that they're really helping anymore, um, and I feel like Frances Harding is a great example of that, because, I mean, like, kids' books can handle really heavy topics, and they frequently do, and, like, in real life, kids have to deal with stuff like that, 
Um, but I think there are things about the way her books are written that just make it very hard to pin them down, which I think is one of the reasons I love them. Cause like, I've noticed that a lot of books I love tend to be very hard to like <laughs> pin down. And as far as like who the intended audience is, um, and like her books get shelved all over the place. Like sometimes they're with children. Sometimes they're with young adults. Sometimes they're just with like general fiction. Like it's just, nobody knows what to do with her books. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And Which... I, I, this, I think we'll, well, we'll see more, I guess, as we go along with the read along, but I, I, this felt less like a children's book than some of her other ones. So I'm interested to track that, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know that she, like on her website and in everything I've seen from her, she like describes herself as a children's author. Um, and I know she's won like children's book prizes, but yeah, like I, I don't know how much of it is just our assumptions of what children's books are supposed to read like. Yeah, true. Um, Cause I think that's definitely a factor, but I also do think there are some things that, um, yeah, just don't fit they don't fit neatly, <laughs> um, which is kind of funny for this book because I think that's that like messiness is very like on brand for like the kind of the themes and the discussions of this book. Um, okay, yeah. Any other thoughts on like the writing or? Yeah, I guess that's what we were talking about mainly is like the writing. <laughs> and we are going to share quotes later too. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah, I think that well with the writing as well, like in some places it's it's really descriptive, um, like with that quote I read about the path. And in some places she also does a really good job of like using one sentence to it really like especially with some of the settings, um, like you really instantly knew exactly what she was talking about, exactly what this place was like just through one sentence. Um yeah. I think it's really like impressive that she's able to do both of those things. Yes, I agree. Yeah, it's like she's really good at knowing what's going to serve the story best. Um, and actually, maybe I should just share this quote now because it's a perfect example of what we were talking about. Um, let's see if I can find it. Yeah, okay. So somebody is asking Mosca, like, why of all the people you could have taken up with, why eponymous Clint? And this is like in her, in her head. Because I've been hoarding words for years buying them from peddlers and carving them secretly onto bits of bark so I wouldn't forget them. And then he turned up using words like epiphany and amaranth because I heard him talking in the marketplace, laying out sentences like a merchant rolling out rich silks because he made words and ideas dance like flames and something that was damp and dying came alive in my mind the way it hadn't since they burned my father's books because he walked into chuff with stories from exciting places tangled around him like maypole streamers. Mosca shrugged. He's got away with words. <laughs> yeah I've marked that one too yeah like I just think that's a really great example like she can have these really beautiful and like evocative passages and then when it just needs a punchy sentence she will give you that um which I also think like that's a great like establishing character for like both of them okay so um I think it makes sense to kind of talk about the setting and the plot together um avoiding spoilers of course because there's a lot going on here <laughs> um so the setting is called the fractured realms and it says in the back of the book that she was like it's very very loosely inspired by england at like certain periods of history um which i think definitely makes sense after finishing the book um yeah but there's there's a lot of backstory this is like a world that is very much like still recovering from multiple different conflicts um, and power struggles. So I guess just like general vague question, um, like how did, how did you feel about the way that the setting and the plot kind of came together? Cause I know we kind of talked about how it can be very confusing. Like there were several sections that I like went back over and I was like, Oh, okay. This is the group of people they're talking about now. Um, yeah. So any thoughts on that? Yeah. I thought, um, yeah, it is. It's definitely a book you have to read with your brain switched on, like, um, and it like it takes me. It took me longer to read than a book of its length usually would, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. 
Um, um, but I thought that the setting was really well done. I liked how um, it was like Britain, but just slightly sideways. Um, there was that, there was a lot, I can't, I was just looking for it and I couldn't find it, but somewhere in the history there was, it was like the English Civil War and then it was, it was when Charles II would have come in that he like died off in France instead and that's when everything changed and I just thought that was an interesting way of like tying it to history and also like making up this complete fantasy world. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that all of the different factions and um, like all the different groups of people who are fighting over like control of this world. Like, I think that like the, the general atmosphere of the book, I think she did a really great job of showing how this wears on ordinary people, like people just going about their everyday lives and like the, like the suffering and like the trauma, like we hear about some of the really horrible things that happened not very far in the past. Um, like there's that scene where Mosca goes to the plumery for the first time that I had forgotten about. And then when I got to that part, I was like, oh. Um, so I, th I think I think what I'm getting at is she does a really good job of making all of that history and all of that like, you know, suffering feel very present in the story. Like this world is not far removed from that. Um, and I think that helps explain why some of these like squabbling factions are so desperate to like be the ones in charge like not that not that that excuse is what they do but i think that's like an interesting um explanation for like their motives i guess mm -hmm. well i think there's that but there's also like the idea that life goes on um mm -hmm. and like regardless of who's in charge or what's happening like even though they've been through all of this trauma like the lives of ordinary people just continue because like what else can you do yeah there's that line where it's like near the end where mosca um she sees people like coming out of their houses after like something big has happened and she thinks about how like when there's danger people will hide but if you wait a little while they'll come out and start selling each other potatoes again That's exactly <laughs> the line i was thinking of yeah 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 i think both of those things are are present here yeah they make a very good balance there's a lot about um i guess there's a lot about balance in this book okay yeah um yeah K kelly's saying as well which um i think in my edition the breakdown of the groups is at the beginning um oh. which is interesting um which is maybe an easier way to go yeah. to it yeah, Kelly, yeah, she's saying there's a lot of world building in the beginning, which is why it took me quite a while to get back into the book. Yeah, okay, my edition also has the breakdown in the back, which I mine think has it is, at the, yeah. Yeah, mine has it before the prelude, which I think is probably helpful. Yeah, yeah, and it, it wasn't until, it wasn't until um, I was partway through the book that I even thought to check um, for like a, uh, oh, because my, my edition also has like um, a, an excerpt from A Face Like Glass. And I guess I assumed that's what like the extra pages were. And then I eventually looked back there. I was like, oh, <laughs> there's like explanations for things. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I do think there's a lot of world building at the beginning. And I had forgotten like that there were multiple layers of like civil war going on here like because mm -hmm. we have mosca's father explaining things to her and that part i thought like okay i got what's going on here i understand what this world is about or like what has just happened recently and then the farther you get in it's like oh and then this group took over and then this group took over and now we're here where these people are fighting like i i still don't know that i completely understand what the watermen do <laughs> like i i thought they were like kind of free agents but then like they're a really important like check on power of other people at the end so i yeah like i'm re i read this twice and i'm like i think i got what happened <laughs> well and i kind of think that in some ways it doesn't really matter because like the point is that people are fighting and the it's more about the effects of it rather than like specifically who's in charge um so like even though it's confusing and maybe you don't completely get have a handle on all of the political machinations I think 
I don't think that's a problem as such. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Plus the fact that like you're you're trying to figure out who's on whose side. Like there's so much backstabbing going on that you kind of get to a point, at least I did, where I'm like, I'm just gonna let you tell me who's on what side, which I think was good. Like I think that actually um I think it, it kept me from getting frustrated with certain plot things because I was like, it makes sense why I'm not getting this because even the characters are like, who are you? Like, <laughs> which group are you part of? Um, yeah, so I, I found that like, I, I could see that being frustrating in other stories, but because of the setup for this one, I was like, this makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's another thing that she does really effectively actually is like um, introducing information in bits through what the characters know. Um, yeah, I think um, I think that's something we'll see in later books as well. Yeah, I agree. Um, and we kind of were we were kind of talking about this a little bit already in terms of like the plot and the setting. Um, but one of the things that we always love about Frances Harding's books are the themes um, and the way that she develops those. Like, I think this one, uh, it deals a lot, obviously, with power. And I think, like, how, you know, absolute power corrupts. Um, but also there's a lot about stories and, like, the power of stories and what is a story versus what is a lie that I think is really interesting. So any thoughts on that or any other things that you think are, like, really important themes or yeah. motifs? Yeah. No. Um, yeah, definitely both of those. And I think also the power of children um, is a big one. Um, yeah. And yeah, and that was the the one thing that I didn't love about the book was the like anti-religious element, um, which possibly I'm slightly defensive about it because I've read another short story of hers where she was kind of not great on religion. Um, mm. And maybe I was like, it's possible that I'm just like looking for it, um, but I didn't love the way that was used. Yeah, well, and that was that was something I noticed as well. And like, because in other books of hers, I feel like it's a little more even-handed. Um, like at least from what I remember, I like the way that she did that in Gullstruck Island. Um, I thought she handled that well. But yeah, like, I, I think what frustrated me about the way this book did that is that, like, it in some ways, it kind of sets up a either religion is a magic wish machine or it's nothing, um, which I I find that very frustrating when, when people paint it that way. So, yeah, I also, um, I think that could have been done better. And I think especially, like, with how thoughtful she is about other ideas, um, yeah, I think that stood out as being a lot less so um yeah. so I, I also had that experience yeah I think also because it was kind of just brought in at the end like like obviously the religion is there in the setting from the start but it like the the idea that it's rubbish um only comes in right to the end and you could have not put it in <laughs> yeah yeah um and especially like at the very beginning of my copy it, it she talks very briefly in the acknowledgments um about some of the inspirations for that which i thought was interesting i mean she doesn't go into detail or anything but yeah i also i think that's one of the thematic elements that if she was if she was gonna bring it in i think it could have been done in a more even-handed way or in a more like i guess intentional way um, so yeah, I also, I also felt like that. Um, let's see, any, any other things? Okay, so we talked about power stories. Oh, you mentioned the power of children, which I really, mm -hmm. I like that you brought that up. I do think that is a really important aspect of this book. Um, I also really like kind of the discussion of like bravery and, like different ways of being brave and like how um I don't know like how you can do something brave and not think that it is and then but like it is because you're doing it I don't think that's a very mm -hmm. good way of describing it but 
yeah, I really liked that. Um, that's another thing we'll get into in spoilers because there's a specific thing I want to talk about. Um, yeah, any other like themes or kind of like topics we want to touch on? I think those are the big ones. Yeah, obviously, yeah, you said stories is obviously a big yeah. one. Yeah, um, and like the power of, of words, I think is mm -hmm. always a crowd pleaser. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see. I think those are all the like non-spoiler things I had to talk about. Is there anything, Hana, that you want to um, discuss before we get into some spoilers? I don't think so. I think that's everything that I had written down. So okay. um, yeah. just that I loved the names of all the people and places yes. um, as well. Like sort of the writing, but also... The naming yeah like goodman palpatattle he who yeah. flies out of butter and jams like yeah i thought that was i thought that was a really fun and like it felt very um very well thought out in the way that it affected like multiple aspects of their life like they had like the clamoring hour where they would all like ring bells the way they think that they were supposed to and kind of how that paralleled the like political aspects where like there were all these different royals who different factions supported like i think that was done well okay Thank you. yeah and like um like chuff like it's just such a you get such a sense of what the place is just from the name yes yeah um because we start out we have like the prologue and then we have the introduction to chuff and right away i was like yep I love her writing like this is just like so good like it just talks about how everyone's like I might have even I might have even been a specific part yeah Chuff could be found by straying as far as possible from anywhere comfortable or significant and following the smell of damp like that's hilarious but it's also such a great way to set up this town that like yeah, and then and then on the same page, Chuff itself was more a tumble than a town. The houses scattered down the incline as if stranded there after a violent flood. It's just, you know, it's just two sentences. That's what I meant before about how, like, she doesn't need many words to describe things sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, just, yeah, the craftsmanship of her writing is just incredibly impressive to me, and I never get tired of it, and I'm never, like... I don't know, like, I'm never, like, not impressed by it, you know? Like, even having read a bunch of her books at this point and having read this one before, I was, like, surprised all over again. I'm like, wow, she's just, like, a really talented writer. Um, okay, so, spoiler territory now. Um, basically, all of my spoiler thoughts are about, the, like, three characters. Lady Tamarind, Lyndon Kohlrabi, and Captain Blythe. <laughs> um, so, I don't know what order we want to go in, but... <laughs> Pick a character. <laughs> um, I thought they were all really interesting. I like um the way they tied to each other. Um, like that. I just like I just was not expecting Captain By to come back. <laughs> <laughs> he could I? He was probably one of my favorite parts of this book. Like he shows up. He's like, "You ruined my life." <laughs> like. I'm a hero now. <laughs> I love that. I also, I just have a weakness for characters like that too. Like the ones who are like, I'm big and scary. I'm the bad guy. And then he's like, oh, well, I can't like not do the right thing. <laughs> like Rescuing people. And yeah, I loved him. I was really glad we had him. I, I, had, I had forgotten like exactly what happened with him, but I had this like memory in the back of my mind from before where I was like, I, was like, I think he becomes like a good guy I don't know it's like something happens with him where he does like something heroic and I didn't remember what it was it's like he's like one of the main good guys which I yeah, love <laughs> and there was and so because through like throughout the book there are like references to you know the, the legends of Captain Blythe and like yeah. all the like Penny Dreadfuls of selling it and stuff and I was like oh that's a fun detail and then <laughs> oh wait <laughs> he's like da 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah when he's when he's talking about like how it happened and um oh he talks about he's like there's this there's this man who was like bullying these two young women and he was like well i wasn't just gonna like let him do that so i show up and i help them he's like he's like i couldn't get their arms off me he's like that part wasn't so bad but like, 
He's such a fun character. And then, okay, wait, I think I actually, I keep forgetting that I have quotes for things. Um, maybe I took a picture of it, but I think there was actually um, something that Clint says to him that I think is just so funny. Oh, okay. So he's talking about how like now he fell in love with Miss Kitely. So he's like invested in multiple ways. And Clint says, ah, I think I understand. There's a charming complication in the matter. A delicate dilemma, a sweet distraction. Clint halted as Mosca elbowed him sharply in the ribs. My dear fellow, he continued more soberly, if you have managed to complicate things by forming a sentimental attachment in less than a week, then I doubt there's anything I can do for you. You, sir, are romantic, and I suspect your condition is incurable. <laughs> I love that. And he is, I think. Um, yeah, so I, I loved him. That was one of my favorite parts. I love that he came back like that. Um, and I think it was nice we had that to kind of balance out the betrayal <laughs> characters. Because um, something I've noticed with Francis Harding's books is I am really not good at pick, like figuring out um, mm -hmm. like alliances or what's the word? I had a word I was thinking of allegiances like who's going to be on what side I'm normally very good at predicting things in books and I just cannot do that with hers like I always seem to like the character that's the twist bad guy <laughs> like I I was really sad I remember being really sad when we find out Lyndon Kohlrabi is who he is mm -hmm. and I remembered that um from the first time I read it so I knew not to get attached this time but I was still like the whole time I was like so disappointed I was like I liked you I <laughs> know yeah, I mean, especially because it's so close to the end. Like, I vaguely remembered that Lady Tamarind was untrustworthy, um, yeah. but Kohlrabi, I didn't call it at all. Yeah, and he, you know, he, like because everyone that Mosca meets is horrible to her, basically, apart from him. Uh, he was so I know. nice. And then... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I remember. Like, I also remember that Lady Tamarind was bad, but I also remembered that I really liked her. Like, I don't think I, I don't think I predicted either of them the first time I read this book. Um, and I still, even like knowing what she does, I didn't remember all the bad things she did um, or like exactly what her motivations were, but I, I knew she was like one of the bad guys. But even knowing that and reading it this time, I'm like, man, she's such a cool character, though. Like, she's so interesting and well-written. And, like, I love how Mosca is kind of, like, dazzled by her a little bit because I also was. I was like, she's just so interesting. Like, she's one of um, she's one of those few, like, villainous characters where I'm, like, I don't know, not enchanted by her. But I, I'm like, I get why I get why she's compelling, you know? Mm -hmm. um i guess i shouldn't say few because that does happen sometimes but in general i'm not like a villain person so much anymore um or, or i'm very picky about them but yeah just like lady tamarind i just i think she's fascinating <laughs> mm -hmm. and i also think it's so clever the way she's introduced because there's that whole bit um with the crocodile and how the locksmiths have been trying to get in so you're like oh so obviously she's good and locksmiths are bad but then oh no <laughs> yeah whoops yeah Twist. <laughs> yeah <laughs> like every time I pick up one of, one of her books I have to be like trust no one but it never works I always <laughs> <sighs> I know um let's see Lady Tamarind and Colby Captain Blythe and then also the thing with Lady Tamarind too is um that we see her up against like kind of like you were saying with the locksmiths is like we see her up against people who we don't like so we kind of assume like okay so she's on the right side like when um when we find out where she got her scar from and like her brother and all that it's like oh maybe she should be taking over the city like even this was wild to me like i even knew that we were going to find out like she was bad or like something about her but when she has that conversation with her brother where she gets him to sign something and she's like we need to act now we need to protect the city I was like yeah listen to her because like, I I didn't remember or I didn't like I don't know I was I was so caught up in like the fact that it seemed like she was doing the right thing that yeah I was fooled again <laughs> um or I don't even know if it was that I was fooled or if I was just like so invested in it, you know, that I didn't stop to think about like, well, wait, if I know that we find out she's bad later, probably shouldn't be rooting for her in this scene. Um, 
Yeah, there's actually like, I'm kind of just sharing all my quotes ahead of time. So feel free to do the same. <laughs> yeah, um, I have many quotes. I'm not going to run out. <laughs> cool. One of my favorite ones, and this one, like, we have discussed how I am very bad at quotes. And I never remember them. But I had remembered this quote for the like three or four years since I had first read the book. Like, I didn't remember it word for word. But I remembered like, what it was about and like the general idea. Um, it's sadly, it's from Lyndon Kohlrabi. Um but he's talking about Lady Tamarind seeing something of herself kind of in Mosca. And that's like the way she treats her the way she does. Um, and he says, I think that when he has this whole description and then he says, I think that when Lady Tamarind looks at you, she feels as the cathedral might. If it suddenly remembered that once it had been a grim little church facing down musket fire and a cruel sea wind. I like, I love that description. Like I clearly, I remembered it for like three and a half years or something. Yeah. Just, I, I don't know, is it is it like the aesthetic of Lady Tamarind as a character that I find so interesting? I don't know. <sighs> like, even the way other characters talk about her, like, they, um, like, somebody says that she, she, I think it might be Clint, says she wears her scar like a crown or something. Like, just, mm -hmm. she's so interesting. <laughs> yeah, and the way that, like, all the ladies in the city dress up as her, um, it's like, the, it's just her whole aura of... yeah. <laughs> She's a very interesting character. And I just, I find it, I guess, um, partly because I also fell under Lady Tamarind's spell a little bit. But I find that so, like, believable why Mosca would be so caught up in her atmosphere. I don't know, like, in, in her whole, like, aura and, um, like, why she would, why she would think about her the way she does and why she would like, like it talks about how she used to want to like go to school and that was like her dream. And now her dream is to like, it's like a means to an end. Like she wants to go to school so that she can work for Lady Tamarind. And she has that vision of like herself coming in to a ballroom. And it's like, I just, it all felt very believable. I'm like, yes, like this is how, I was going to say how a kid, but like, obviously we do it too. <laughs> like it just like, she captures the imagination. And I think that, like the book shows that like beautifully. Yeah. Yeah. And like again, because it, she's so kind of completely outside the realm of anything Mosca's experienced or even thought to expect um yeah. in her life. So yeah, it makes complete sense. Yeah. Yep. Um in terms of like other spoilery things once again i forgot something pretty significant like mosca walks in and clint is like holding a dead body and i'm like who is this <laughs> like, I, I had like no memory of that um and then i i couldn't remember who had done it or like if maybe clint had like i was i don't know like i remembered him being like my feelings of him at the end of the book were not um like we're not like villains. Like I wasn't thinking of him as like a villain or an antagonist. Like I remember liking the way he and Mosca ended things, like with their friendship. So I'm like, I don't think he would have killed him, but I genuinely don't remember. <laughs> like, Mosca did, and I was kind of wondering too. <laughs> yeah, and and even when when Mosca talks to the cakes, and the cakes are describing the. And it's sorry. It... I think you froze for a second. Oh, strange. Okay, it's working. Um, it's working now. Okay. Yeah. No, I was just saying um, the bit where Cakes um, is talking about the wedding with the dead body. Um, the and like it's completely the description of Kohlrabi, and you're so, but you're just so, like, not looking for it, and just you just don't see it, even though. It should be so obvious at that point. Yeah. Yep. I mean, even with the benefit of having read it before, I like, yeah, I didn't, I didn't remember that that, that he was the one who did that. Um, yeah. And then like when Mosca um, turns him in because she thinks that he's the one who did it. And it's like, it's a good moral step for her, even though she's wrong. Um <laughs> But yeah, by that point, I'm like, why am I remembering them as friends? Like, what? 
what has to happen before that to like make sense to me? It was like, what was I thinking four years ago? Yeah, um, but like Claire just doesn't tell her he had every opportunity to tell her. <laughs> like, like I didn't oh, kill this. Oh, by person. the way. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Is like that he, he had um he had opportunity to be like, by the way, in case you were wondering, like this corpse is not mine. Like I did this not- corpse that I'm very suspiciously trying to draw, <laughs> very in the bottom of this lake. <laughs> I didn't kill. Feel- <laughs> it just happened to be here. Don't worry about it. Um, yeah, and I do like that when they make up, he does kind of. I don't remember if he like actually apologizes, but he he basically. Oh, it's when it's I'm trying to remember. Sorry. It's when she says, like, you didn't turn me in Um, because she had helped him hide the body. And so if she thought he was like a bad guy, you know, he could have done. And he's like, no, I didn't. I'm like, OK, that's one of those nice things that just throws me off. <laughs> like, um, Yeah, I just I guess I just built up their friendship much more quickly in my head than it actually happened. Because <laughs> like 80 percent of this book, they're like working against each other. <laughs> Yeah, and like the entire time Mosca's trying to find, you know, something like dirt on him that will be more than whatever he can say about her. Um, more than the fact that she burned down her uncle. Yeah. <laughs> um, which again is just so believable, the like the way like the fact that she thinks in those terms. Yeah. Yeah. Um and even like something I was thinking about is in a lot of books, I find it very, like, frustrating or, like, stressful in, <laughs> I was gonna say stressful in an unpleasant way, but it's like, you know, sometimes you're reading books and it's like, this is stressful, but I, I get why it's happening, I'm not mad about it, and then there's some things where it's like, this is stressful and I'm mad about it, <laughs> like, in a lot of books, I will be, like, mad about how stressed I am when it's something, like, the main character is, like, clearly trusting the wrong people or, like, is clearly, like, betraying the wrong person or, like, especially with plot lines that involve a lot of, like, spying and, like, informing on people. Um, I find that very irritating a lot of times, but in this one it didn't bother me because it was not actually clear who she should be, like, like, who should be spying on whom and like who should be getting the information like up until the end of the book i was like don't trust the locksmiths like they're bad (laughs) but they ended up having to work together with them so i think that was why it didn't frustrate me is because like i also don't really know what's going on here (laughs) okay so should we just get into the rest of our quotes then I, think um, that's I was going to say, um, yes. a character that you didn't have on your list, but um, Hopewood Bertellis. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he was a sweetie. He, yeah, I just, again, I just have such mixed feelings about him because they were like, are you running the secret printing press? And he's like, well, so what if I am? And he wasn't. Like, I just say you're not doing it. His confidence was very misplaced. Like, like there's there's a time to be cocky and this is not it like yeah and then I couldn't remember see this is like she's such a smart writer because like I had this like feeling about um well like I remembered Kohlrabi being bad even though he seems very nice and I was like is Pertellis bad too I was like did I forget like is he is he like working together with the bad guys and like he was not and like there's that part where um somebody's telling Mosca about how he's been arrested and he's like, like for all these things that he's supposed to have done. And Oh, basically that he was like a violent radical and that he was, you know, going to bring down ruin on everyone. And Mosca's just like, um, he tries to stick snails back together. <laughs> I was like, Oh, and that was the moment where I'm like, no, I think he's actually good. Like <laughs> tries to rescue little snails. Yeah. And yeah. I just, I just love the scene. Um, the whole scene um, with the like secret school, um, but the you know the, where all the children like kidnap him off the street and then <laughs> put him back and then when he's leaving, and there's a line that's, like Mosca had never seen the only person Mosca had ever seen cause so much chaos was Saracen, like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you kind of you kind of can't tell if it's intentional or not. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I, I, I also liked <clears throat> Hopewood Pertellis. He was he was lovely. Um, 
I was worried about him because clearly I was not remembering things from the book. I was like, I hope he doesn't actually get executed here. Like, I have no idea what's going to happen. Um, I also really loved that moment on the river where all the other boats like show up to help them. I always love things like that. I didn't remember though. It was because Captain Blythe was aboard. <laughs> They're like, we couldn't let that happen to him. It's like so dramatic and romantic. Like, yeah, I, I love the bit where um where they let Mosca down and the girls. What color are his eyes? Um, are they green? Like, yeah, def- they're definitely green. <laughs> She's like, I couldn't disappoint them. Yeah, oh, that was great. And I I love like all these like little moments with the with the supporting characters, like the cakes and um Carmine. I think is his name. Like the boy who who she likes mm-hmm. and who likes her, which is also lovely because like she's been wanting to like be in love for so long, and she like loves weddings, but nobody would like want her. So I love that she gets that happy ending. But um when the ship gets fired on and it's like he like protects her and it's like he was still protecting her she must feel very safe indeed like he's just like holding her like on the floor and they're just like there for like 15 minutes like Mosca leaves to do something and comes back and they're still there Uh, yeah I liked Carmine I mean he was he was like a very minor character but I liked the um, cause he, he was the one who, who like stopped Mosca from getting to the school at first. So I like, mm-hmm. wasn't, I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about him. But then, um, when we saw him interacting with cakes, which like, I wish I remembered her name. Cause they tell us like once, but I don't remember what it is. I think it starts with a D. Dormaline? Dormaline. I think, it, yeah, I is think it, it was. I mean, like I feel that. like I could just make up a collection of sounds and it would <laughs> sound <laughs> yeah it would probably work yeah um any other characters we want to talk about i think those were the main ones i liked um i liked caveat um yeah <laughs> Like, she just, she writes these characters that are just so endearing, and I can't explain why, and it, it's just, he's so nervous all the time, and I empathize, like, <laughs> like, the way he, like, breaks up his sentences, it's like, why is that something that endears him to me? I don't know, but I don't want anything bad to happen to him, <laughs> like, those are the main ones i would have um i was really interested in the the twin queens i don't know if they come up again in the sequel because they're so interesting yeah yeah i also found i thought they were really intriguing characters um like we don't even see them but they have like a very strong presence in the book because of like the duke and everything um yeah i would also be interested to see like i just i think she's so good Princess Harding is so good at, like, making her world feel, like, completely filled in, and she just tells you what you need to know, so it's, like, uh, I don't know, it feels like we're getting the picture that we need, but there's other stuff going on, you mm-hmm. know, like, it's a, like an, it's an actual world that she's giving us a snapshot of, rather than, like, having to fill in information as we go, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, so I, I also, I'm curious to see if the Twin Queens come up again, or, like, um, because I don't, I don't think the book is the sequel is set in the same place, but I'm not sure. Like I think it's in a different city, but it, it might still be. We might yeah. still get to because they. Characters. I mean, they're not in. But they're in a different city anyway. So, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Wait. Was the Duke? Is the Duke in the capital? He's not. The, right. Mandelion is not the capital, right? Right. That took me Which a while I, to realize. Me too. I, I was very confused. So, okay. Yeah, so the, the Twin Queens are, like, somewhere else. And the Duke is in Mandelion. But I'm trying to remember what the things... Because like, there were some things that were happening in the capital that I thought were happening in this setting. Because I also... It took me a while to realize that. Yeah, and I, I was sure I remembered Mosca going to the capital. Yeah. Um, which either means I've read the sequel and forgotten about it, or I'm thinking of a different process. <laughs> it's either as possible, yeah. Or I've made it up completely. One of yeah. the <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm excited to see which one it is <laughs> when we get to the sequel. 
Um, okay, do we want to get into the rest of our quotes? Yeah. I don't know how many you want to do. <laughs> You're like, I, I have stacks. Um, I... Let's see. I think I probably shared most of mine. I think I did actually. So just go, go for it whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, <laughs> I liked. Um, it is a very terrible thing to be far smaller than one's rage. Um, yes, I felt a kinship with Mosca. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. And um, where um, where is your sense of patriotism? I keep it hid away safe, along with my sense of trust, Mister Clint. I don't use them much in case they get scratched. Yes. It's just, it just sums up Mosca so perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that, I think you hit on like one of the great things about these like really funny or clever lines is it's not, they're not just like one-liners. They're like really indicative of characters and like mm -hmm. what's going on. I love that. Yeah. She did not notice herself making the, uh, Mosca had decided that she would leave Mandelion with Clint. She did not notice herself making the decision. Rather, the decision seemed to have fallen into her head from the rain laden sky. She hoped that there would be no war and that in time Clint would bring her back. Um, there was a throb in her mind when she thought of Lady Tamarind, but for now, someone seemed to want Mosca with them, and that was too strange and new to be thrown away lightly. Yeah. Yeah, Mosca being just, like, bewildered at affection just, like, hurts my heart. <laughs> Perhaps the world has always been like this, Mosca thought as she pushed her way through the crowd, like a broken honeypot that looks whole, but just holds together because the shards are resting in place and are glued together with honey. You just need to prod it a bit, and it all starts oozing apart. Yep. Like... Like I think it's um I think you've said before that um it's metaphors that you wouldn't ever think to use, but once you've read them, you know exactly what they mean. Yeah. Yeah. Like she compares things to other things where it's like I have never heard someone do that before, but I, I get it immediately, whereas sometimes um <laughs> well, like when we read Save Me the Waltz by Zelda Fitzgerald um, last month, like, there were just, like, word combinations that, like, made no sense. Like, she would describe things in ways that were, like, I, I don't even know why you picked this word. Like, it just, it, it didn't create an image. It didn't create a feeling. It was just, like, word salad. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas, yeah, like, I think Frances Harding is great at, like, she she uses words creatively, but in ways that still make sense. I think those are all my quotes actually so yeah i think that's the main ones of mine i have shared several so <laughs> <laughs> i mean i i don't mind if you want to share more i picked out like the few that i was like i think this is like a quote that will come up in discussion that'll be good to talk about but in terms of just like lines that i loved i yeah there were there were many um there's the one about truth, but that's a long one. Read it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, truth is dangerous. It topples palaces and kills kings. It stirs gentle men to rage and bids them take up arms. It wakes old grievances and opens forgotten wounds. And is the mother of the sleepless night and the hag-ridden day. And yet there is one thing that is more dangerous than truth. Those who would silence truth's voice are more destructive by far. It is most perilous to be a speaker of truth. Sometimes one must choose to be silent or be silenced. But if a truth cannot be spoken, it must at least be known. Even if you dare not speak truth to others, never lie to yourself. Yeah. That was a good one as well. Yeah. I think, I think, I mean, truth is a, was a big theme as well, like linked to the stories and the, the power of words. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I also, I really liked um, the idea of like, you tell a story and then it becomes true or like you make it true because, because of your reaction to the story, like what happened with Captain Blythe. Captain Blythe. <laughs> um, 
Just the MVP of this book who came out of nowhere. <laughs> I love him so much. Uh, I'm like very invested in him. I hope him and Miss Kitely are very happy. <laughs> um, that's another thing I feel like Chris Harding is so good at is like we don't even see them interact really. And I'm like, I ship it. Like, I think that's so fun. <laughs> it's like, we have not seen them interact, but just because we know who they are as characters, I was like, I love that. Um, yeah. And we, di we didn't really talk about Miss Kitely. I don't have much to say about her, but. I loved her as well. Yeah. I thought she was brilliant. Oh, that was another great quote, which I think I've seen people quote from this book before, is like when, I think it's Mr. Portellis, um, he says something like, there's always something that will hold a lady back from the worst kinds of villainy. And Miss Kitely is like, no, there isn't. Drink your coffee, Mr. Portellis. <laughs> like, um, yeah. Okay, so uh, I think that's everything I have. Um, anything else or we can go ahead and wrap up. Um, our next book is going to be Flytrap, which is the sequel. Um, mm -hmm. It's called Twilight Robbery in the UK, just in oh, case that's confusing yes. anyone. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, remind me after the show and I will put that in the description. Um, I thought they had stopped doing that with the titles. That's very frustrating. Um, okay, so either Flytrap or Twilight Robbery. We are reading the sequel to this book, which like it is the only, um, it's the only one we're reading out of publication order, and it's the only books that are in series um, that Frances Harding has done, and that will be sometime in October, like mid month, um, mm -hmm. date and time to be determined. Just keep an eye on um, Hannah's and my social media. Um, and yeah, and Hannah will be running that discussion again. It'll be on my channel, but. Um, she will be yeah. leading the questions and everything um, and directing me when to click on comments because that's the only <laughs> thing that's going to be like, kind of hard to figure out um, okay yeah is there anything I'm forgetting anything else you want to say oh hi, hi Julia <laughs> I think she had or maybe her live show was yesterday but okay so anything else I think that's everything all right. And if we have forgotten anything, that'll be, um, I'll add that to the video description or we will post it on our social media or something. But um, thank you guys for joining in. We hope to see you for some of our future books, whichever ones that you can make it or you're interested in. Um, and yeah, thanks for hanging out and talking about one of our favorite authors with us. <laughs>